If you've got your Bibles, turn to Psalm 46. It's in the Pew Bible in front of you as well. And let's stand together as we honor the reading of God's Word. Psalm 46 is our text for us this morning. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come to your word, and as we've had it sung and read already this morning, uh, we submit ourselves to your word and to your reign in our life. Lord, as we are confronted this morning with uh, our own weakness, may we find our strength and refuge in you. Would you be at work in each heart present here this morning, uh, Lord, to do your will and have your way with us that you might change us more and more into the likeness of Christ by the grace and mercy of your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. This is the opening sentence to A.W. Tozer's classic work, The Knowledge of the Holy. And whether you agree with Tozer or not, it's a thought-provoking statement that challenges us in all aspects of our life, from the most important matters, the things that we find that occupy the most uh, of our time, our resources, our thoughts, down to what seem to be the least significant. Another way to ask that question is, how does what you know and believe about God affect your life? This is especially important when our attempts at a, at a neatly ordered, and controlled life turn into what seems to be a spiral of uncontrolled chaos. That happens certainly on a small scale. Perhaps you've experienced it this week. Uh, maybe it was a line that formed in front of your favorite store at 4 a.m. this past Friday when grown, otherwise reasonable adults are are unleashed inside of a store as the doors open and chaos ensues, all because 75% off on a TV plus rebate? I mean, that's like blood in the water, right? Anyone brave those Black Friday? I'm, don't answer that. But chaos is true on a small scale, even an insignificant one like that, but it's also true on a very large scale. We look at our world events both natural and man-made, and wonder that age-old question that's been asked before us and will be asked after us, what is this world coming to? We think about the issues facing our country and countries around the world, and that doesn't even begin to touch the issues that you may be struggling with in your own family and in your own life. I was very appreciative of of Judy's testimony this morning, giving us a look into her own life and many of the lives in college church. And this morning, you may be here feeling alone in the midst of that chaos. And my encouragement to you this morning is to listen, pay close attention to what God has to say to you this morning. For you, my friend, are not alone. Some of these things you've been made acutely aware of this past week and maybe doesn't give you uh, the warm and fuzzy feeling that you're looking for as you go forward into the remainder of this holiday season. But what comes to mind when you think about God? Is it the most important thing about you? What comes to mind when you think about God when the waters like this are stirred? How are your thoughts, your attitudes, and actions affected by what you know and who you know God to be 
in the middle of chaos. Growing up, we used to have tornado drills in school, and I was talking with someone this week who told me they had a similar drill. They grew up in the 50s and had uh, bomb drills. Some of you can nod along, you remember that. Uh, but these tornado drills that I grew up with, they, the alarm went off and uh, a room full of elementary school kids formed a line and rushed down the hall to try to find the safest, most secure spot in the school. And we'd sit on the floor with our backs up against a cinder block wall with our hands over our heads. Now, I have no idea what exactly that's going to do to prevent us from being injured in a tornado, much less a bomb. Uh, but we all want to know that when we are faced with trouble, a dangerous situation, turmoil, chaos, we know we want to be safe. And so we look for security. We want to be hurried off to the most secure place possible. We want to know that it's going to turn out okay. Sometimes we rightly pray and we seek the Lord. We seek the counsel of others. But sometimes we turn to, to other objects of security and refuge. Maybe for some it's your bank account or somebody else's bank account. Or maybe it's whatever your area is of expertise and that you've gained enough life experience to rely on that for security. But what happens when even those places of refuge aren't quite as secure as we thought they would be? They don't hold up. Well, Psalm 46 has often been seen as a psalm of confidence and security in the face of chaos for those people who are facing chaotic situations. You know, people, everyone, all of us, me, you, from time to time. But why? Why can we have this confidence? This, this psalm carries with it a, a tone almost of confidence in the midst of battle, which is the way the song was just sung that we heard. How do we have confidence and even stillness in the midst of chaos? Is it possible? Or is it just something we say to make ourselves or someone else feel better? Again, what you believe about God is the most important thing about you. So who is this God that we should know? And how should we think of him? Who is this God that brings chaos in, into order and calms our fears and stills our hearts? And ultimately, why does it even matter? Well, that's the aim of this song. To show us that in the midst of chaos, in the midst of all of the collapsing idols of security around us, that God is alone our refuge. And that's our hope this morning. And that's the way this psalm begins. Our author, who we don't know, we don't know the, the direct uh, circumstances under which this psalm was written, but he wants his readers to know right from the start that there are characteristics and realities about God that affects our lives. And anytime the Bible starts a sentence by saying God is, it's, a, it's an indication to us that we better perk up and listen up because something's going to be said about God that can change who we are. So God is, God is from verse 1, our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. This is the summary opening to the psalm, the entire psalm, and it begins by focusing our thoughts immediately on who God is, the reality of who he is. When times of trouble and chaos come and attempt to reassert itself over uh, the, the realm of order in our lives, this is where we must begin. When control starts to slip through our fingers like sand, as if we ever had control in the first place, we must ask ourselves, who is God in the midst of this? Well, three things to observe right from the, uh, observe right from the start about who God is. One, he's our refuge. He is our safety. He is our shelter and our security. That's the image here of refuge. Second, God is our strength. And all of our strength, not just a source of strength, but the source of strength that is in him and from him, and his strength never runs out. It is unfailing. And then lastly, God is our help in trouble. And this carries with it the connotation of when we are afflicted, when trouble comes our way, God's help exceeds the help of all other sources of help. And these aspects of who God is has implications on how we live. And these implications are, are actually less about the actions that we take or what we do and are more focused on the posture that we should take in the midst of chaos. Because God is our refuge, there are two implications that we want to look at from this text. First, we're going to see that because God is our refuge, we need not fear. And that's going to be from verses 2 through 7. 
And then second, because God is our refuge, we can be still. And that's verses 8 through 11. So first, God is our refuge. We need not fear. Well, this psalm starts out with a, with a very helpful cause and effect back and forth between verses 1 and 2. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, cause, therefore, the effect is, we will not fear. Now, that's simple enough, right? So maybe we should just close in prayer. I'll give you a coffee cup or something with that verse on it, and you can take it home and remember that, and your life will go swimmingly, right? Just as good as that cup of coffee will taste. Well, it's not that easy, unfortunately. But because these truths are hard to grasp onto, it doesn't make the reality of the truth any less significant or tremendous in our lives. It's one thing to say this, that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. It's another thing to know this is true and to live it out and experience the fullness of this reality that results in a fearlessness that can otherwise not be explained. Do not fear is perhaps the most given command in all of Scripture. We see it all throughout Scripture. But this way of saying this isn't so much a command, but a response and a declaration. It's a declaration that says, because of who God is, this is how I will live. Because God is my source of security, I will not fear. And to show us this, the psalmist contrasts the security we have in God with a false sense of security we sometimes place in two very common symbols of stability, nature and nations. Now, to call nature and nations, the earth and maybe politics, a false source of security can sometimes seem a little little bit crazy in our culture. Because I can't think of too many other things that are argued about more in our culture at large than earth and politics. It's on the front pages or second pages or third and throughout all of the pages, whatever you're reading these days, as much as you can find. But they are, after all, important. In fact, God cares about both of these tremendously. Our planet is important. Creation care is important. God has given us this place to steward well what he has created. And as the Lord tarries, it's a place where future generations will hopefully grow and flourish. Nations are important. Orderly civilization is crucial. The Lord cares about the nations. But our psalmist reminds us that as important as these symbols of stability are, they aren't to be the ultimate source of our refuge and strength as the people of God. So let's look at these two common symbols of security and how they are faulty and can actually cause us fear uh, when they fail. And then then we'll contrast that with God's stability. First, nature or the earth cannot be our refuge, even though most of the time it is a picture of refuge and rest and strength. For many of us who live in the suburbs or a metropolitan area, you commute down to the city often. Uh, Like Chicago, a, a more rural and scenic place is what you desire for your getaway, for maybe your vacation, or even just a refuge. And in fact, there are probably people watching online right now who are at a place where we long to be, right? If you are, you can send me an email. A picture would be nice. Well, my family and I, were, we were seeking this uh, this past summer. Uh, we were headed down south for a little uh, rest and relax- re- relaxation, um, a vacation. And as we were making a pit stop in Georgia, it became very clear that the rest of our trip down to Florida was going to have to be canceled or put on hold. Because as we were packing our bags to head further south, Hurricane Irma was coming north. And we turned around and came home. Well, that's essentially what's being described here in verse 2. Now, not that you have to cancel your vacation plans, but what is normally seen as a desirable place of refuge, the earth, the mountains, a scenic place, these places themselves will give way. The mountains will be moved into the heart of the sea, waters roar and foam, so much so that the mountains tremble. And this can cause us great fear, particularly if this is our source of refuge and hope. Fortunately, my family and I, we didn't have a direct encounter with the hurricane. But perhaps you have been in a helpless situation caused by perhaps even a natural disaster. Maybe it was an earthquake or tornado, something like that that's unpredictable. I think what's being described here is something so strong like an avalanche or even a tsunami-like force that can bring even the greatest mountains into the heart of the sea. 
In other words, he's describing, our psalmist is describing a worst case scenario. When we look at a mountain, uh, and maybe you've observed this through, through literature, through music, through poetry, through artwork, mountains, even biblical language is often uh, uh, showing mountains to be a great source, a symbol of stability and strength, consistency. But this picture is that even as great as mountains can be a symbol of hope for us, Even these greatest images of refuge are perhaps not as strong as we thought. But there is a source that is more stable and more reliable, more constant and even more steady. Look with me in verse 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. You see, while waters of chaos can roar and foam and cause mountains to tremble, there is a river that is God himself, the source of refuge and gladness for his people where all other sources fall short. And this picture of God as our steady river of gladness shows us that God is with us. In fact, he's more than a symbol. And he offers us something more than a symbol. God is in the midst of her, verse five. His people, uh, he's in the midst of his people. As a river is through the heart of the valley of a mountain, God will help his people when the morning dawns. And these images are of a new beginning and hope. And they stand in stark contrast to to the destruction and chaos that can inevitably come over other sources of refuge. So nature cannot be Our source of refuge and strength, it can't be our symbol of that, nor can nations. Verse 6, just as waters roar and foam, nations rage and kingdoms totter. And we certainly live in times where we are prone to worry and fearful and are fearful about the future. I was having a conversation with someone about that just this week. But this is nothing new. Though we experience times of, of relative peace in our civilization, In civilizations past, many boast of of the golden age, Roman Empire, things like that. Even in the book of Judges that saw so much turmoil and and turn over for for the kingdom of Israel, there are periods of rest, even 40 to 80 years throughout that book. But there's always an undercurrent of hostility waiting to rise up. Power grabs, abuse of authority, rebellion against authority. And that goes for all generations of all time. Friends, we can't just put our hope and security in the outcome of one election cycle versus another. We can't draw our strength ultimately from which laws are passed and which ones aren't. No, of course, we fight for social justice. We fight for life. We advocate for, re- for religious liberty. But in comparison to divine power, which is what we're talking about this morning, the earth itself melts. And that's language that we don't use very often, maybe never. The earth itself melts and nations stand powerless before the voice of the Lord, the Lord himself. People of God, the Lord is your fortress. Nations can build fortresses, strongholds, can build monuments, symbols of greatness and security. And you can get on a plane right now, travel across the world and stand in line to see their ruins. The Lord is your fortress. He is your security. But in all of this, we look at God who offers us not just a symbol in himself. He offers us himself. Though everything else is stripped away, God is with us. Verse 7, God is our refuge. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. He is our refuge in truth, but also in presence. Therefore, we need not fear. I wonder what burden of fear that you may be carrying with you as you, brought, you came in here this morning. What are you bringing in with you? What do you think of when you think of God in the midst of what you're fearful of? Well, to see this in action, maybe we need some proof. We need to look no further than the Advent season. We've been talking about it some already this morning. Do you know what Advent means? The word Advent, the dictionary definition, is the arrival of a notable person. Now, when attached to the arrival, the incarnation of God himself, this may be the greatest understatement in the history of the world to say that it's just the arrival of a notable person. 
But Advent, Jesus himself coming to earth is our Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus, who was born into this broken world, which at no time did he cease to have control over, lived during the reign of one of the greatest empires that the world has ever seen, the Roman Empire, which stands no more. The Lord of hosts is with us, and he proved it as the word, the logos of the universe became flesh and dwelt among us, but not only dwelt among us, he lived among us, this righteousness before us in this sin-stained world. He died for us and was raised again for us. And this is the good news, the gospel that we are invited into that secures us in Christ. And so if you need proof that, that we are, are gods, that he is going to be with us, if you need proof of this, pay attention this December. Ask God to give you fresh eyes to see the advent of the Savior, God with us. As Pastor Moody leads us through this messianic look at, at Jesus, the Christ, the Savior of the world. And just as the angel said to Mary and God says to us, do not be afraid. Rather say with the psalmist, God is my refuge, I will not fear. So that's the first implication of who God is that we need not fear. But the second implication as we consider God as our refuge is that we can be still. We can be still. This final section, verses 8 through 11, uh, begins with an invitation. Really, it's an invitation to the world. All, all of the statements before us are summarized here. As you have beheld this shaky ground, the other forms of security that we're tempted to put our hope in, come behold the works of the Lord himself. He is the one who as, is at work in the midst of even the desolations on the earth. He is the one who quiets the storm and calls for peace among nations. And at his name, at the name even of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he alone is Lord. Therefore, come behold the works of the Lord. Be reminded and be still and know that he is God among the nations and he will be exalted in all the earth. It's interesting here that we have these two side-by-side -side commands. We have this invitation to come and behold, yet that we are invited then and commanded to be still in light of this and know that he is God. And I wonder, as you've probably read this before, it's a familiar passage, have you considered the audience to whom God is speaking? I think we assume most of the time that it's to me and it's to God's people, and I think it includes God's people to be sure. But I think it's broader than that. It's an invitation to all of those who have been already addressed in this psalm. It's, it's, an, it's a call to be still enemies of God, enemies of nations, nations themselves, the wind and the waves, even people of God, all creation, stand down and cease your chaos and know that the Lord is God. He is God above all. And he has no rival. He will be exalted. There is no source or symbol of security that can ever rival him. And this is what we must know. I do think there is, though, special application to those who are part of this city of God. His people, as we're described here. The people who find their gladness in him. I wonder if that's you this morning. If you're a follower of Christ, it is. But as you experience times of chaos and our vision of God gets blurry, our understanding of him can become confused. Stillness escapes us and is replaced with restlessness. And all of these things seem to prevail over us. How does this stillness happen? Well, we are called to know God. But this is not just a tip of the hat to knowledgeable facts about who he is, many of which we could recite. But to know him. Know who he is and know what he has done and know his promises and know that they are true. And this is not a stillness in the sense of passivity or an absence of activity or a stillness in the way of just emptying your mind and trying to find some uh, escaping inner peace. This is an active stillness that involves actually filling your mind to cease from struggling with all of these other things by meditating on the bedrock truth of his word. And that's very different. This idea of knowing is very different, I think, from what we can observe in culture. Perhaps you've noticed that not so subtly the word thinking is being replaced with the word feeling in our modern vocabulary. 
I even find myself say it all, saying it all the time. I feel like instead of I'm thinking this. Uh, you probably have done it a time or two. Well, how would you feel if you witness the mountains crash into the sea? How do you feel when you see the nations totter and nations rage against one another? How do you feel when chaos is abounding in your own life? I like the way that Alistair Begg, the, the Scottish preacher, addresses this question. He related the story about when he was on vacation and visiting another church and the, the person who was leading worship got up that morning and, and began the service by saying, how do y'all feel this morning? As he thought about the answer to that question, uh, he, he didn't know exactly what to say. But he thought, don't ask me how I feel about myself. Ask me what I know about God and what can deal with my soul. This morning, I've already spilled my coffee. I had a hard time finding a place to park. I forgot to read my Bible. I'm a miserable wretch, and you want me to know how I, you want to know how I feel? I feel rotten. That's what he said. How do you, what do you have for me this morning, preacher? Well, I wondered if we had polled each of you as you walked in here this morning. How would you have answered that? Now, let's be honest. Some of you are probably feeling great. We're coming off of Thanksgiving. You've got the greatest opportunity to have leftovers that you'll have all year long. You can have it this week. Maybe your team won yesterday. Mine didn't, but that's okay. But you're feeling great. Just don't tell anybody. You don't want to make somebody else feel bad. Because have you ever asked a, a family with young children how they feel on a Sunday morning when they come in here? You probably want an exit strategy or a hug when you ask that question. But all kidding aside, I know, and if you were here for our Thanksgiving Eve service, you know, and nobody has to tell you, but you know that people are coming in here with, with aching joints, recent diagnoses, family troubles that maybe have been so acutely highlighted this past week. How are you feeling doesn't quite cut it this morning because you have burdened souls and hurting hearts. Now listen, I'm not trying to downplay feelings. I praise the Lord for feelings and how our affections are stirred for him and for one another. I know how I've felt as I've heard Psalm 46 sung for us. I've heard it three times today. And I know that my affections have been stirred for the Lord. But I know this because I know who God is. We should feel, we do feel, God has made us affectionate beings, but just like every part of us affected by sin, our feelings aren't always true and trustworthy. Because in the midst of chaos, let's face it, I have a lot of feelings. And you can ask me about how I feel, but I don't need you to affirm my feelings. I need someone to tell me what I need to know and let truth guide me. And that starts with knowing that God is in control. Be still and know that he is God in control and he alone is our refuge. Come behold his works. Because there are many, many times when life feels out of control. And you need to know in those moments that life is never uncontrolled. And the God who is in control is the Lord of hosts, the God of Jacob. And he is your refuge. Therefore, we can be still. So I wonder this morning, as we've looked at these false sources and symbols of security, I wonder what your mountain is, and then what is your mountains into the sea moment? Maybe it's already happened and you're recovering and picking up the pieces from that. Maybe you're in the middle of it as you're watching the avalanche come at you and know there's nothing you can do. I wonder what you're most afraid of that in your mind's eye, if this were to happen to me, this is where I'd be tested the most. What is your mountains into the sea moment? Where are you tempted to reach for security apart from God in the midst of that? But then how does what you know about God define you in the middle of chaos, even in unexpected ways? And how is his presence and help affecting your life? You see, this is what we're being called to this morning from this psalm, that in the midst of chaos, God calls us not to a symbol, but to himself. And he offers us himself, our refuge. Let's close in prayer as we pray about these things. Lord, we are grateful and thankful in this season of thanksgiving that in the midst of chaos, 
we can know that you are our refuge. And where we feel weak, you are our strength. And you are our fortress. Lord, we also confess that in the midst of confusion, a blurred vision of you, that we've lost sight. And that we've put our ultimate hope, sense of being, sense of well-being, in other symbols, in other places of security, even good things. Lord, would you forgive us of these things and point us, redirect us back to you to let us know that you are. Lord, would you be at work this morning, even as we respond now in song, to give us thankful hearts to continue in this season of thanksgiving, that in the midst of chaos, of hurt, and brokenness, that we can be glad because you are in our midst. We thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen.